Hi friends, it's me, teacher Emily. Oh, <laughs> I'm making a big introduction. <laughs> Isabel. Isabel, come on over here. So we promised you that we'd have some more um, videos for you. You okay? okay? I stubbed my toe. You stubbed your toe, I'm sorry. All right, it's okay, she's fine. Today we're going to be learning about our new artists of the month. So last month before you left, we were doing Pied Mondrian and we were learning about kind of very uh, geometric design. We are going to completely switch that a bit and go into Pablo Picasso. World. Pablo Picasso's world, that's right. Let's tell parents a little bit about what this looks like on the shelf. Um, so in our classroom, we currently have two tables set up in the blue room that are dedicated for art exploration. One of them has been uh, set up for a while for artist of the month, and the other one is our Black History Individual of the Month. Um, and so we've been doing things like astronauts and making our uh, sensory jars. This usually hangs on the wall above the table for inspiration. It gives a little bit of a biography of the artists that we're studying. So it's done by group presentation. And then on the table itself, we usually have a tray like this. And so I've been posting a lot about keeping Montessori alive and active in your home. The number one thing about Montessori is it's independent, uh, self-guided learning. And the role of the adult in a Montessori classroom is to prepare the environment for the child. And the assistants or co-teachers in a Montessori classroom are not assistants or co-teachers of the children, they're the assistants of the lead guide. So they don't assist the child in doing things, they just assist the adult, the other adult, in creating a prepared environment. And what does that mean? So knowing your own child, and I know all of your children now for the last couple of years, they're all capable of cutting and using torn paper technique. So you could just provide raw materials such as um, construction paper. However, sometimes some children feel overwhelmed and Montessori wrote, you should never help a child with something at which they find themselves capable. So even if it's not how you want it to look, you need to let go of your ego and allow them to explore and build up their own skills. When we consistently do something for a child, what we are telling them is, I do it better than you. And we don't want to do that, that, that lower self-esteem. Uh, and when we constantly say, good job, good job, what you're saying is that this is the epitome of what they've done and there could be nothing better. And so we leave those kind of judgments. It's a, it's a judgment call. We do it to make children feel good, but it really is a judgment of their work. And so we don't um, advocate that. Instead, we say, I see you worked really hard on that. Or wow, look at that. You did, if you want to specifically point out something, you made that line so straight, you must have worked so hard on that. So again, focusing more on the process than the product because what does good job really mean anyway, right? And we can always do better, can't we? And what one of the human tendencies Montessori observed, and that has been observed when we start talking about psychology and executive functions, is this idea of self-perfecting, that we always work to obtain better, that we always want to give our personal best. Um, and so not diminishing it or exalting it, just allowing it to be whatever it is and being okay with that. Um, good job is more about us as the adult, right? Not about the child. So. If you wanted to provide things, if you needed, let's say, an hour a day where nobody was bothering you or calling you what? or asking you to do something, you could cut things like the hands out, which are um, a multi-sequenced task. So you have to be able to trace the hand and then you have to be able to cut it out. Um, and children do experience fatigue. So even though they are capable, sometimes their little hands just get tired because they are developing not just the skills, the eye to hand coordination, but also the hand muscles. So these are some hands that we pre cut out. We'll show you how we traced some. Yes, go ahead. This is my hand. That is Isabel's hand. That's true. It's a little smaller than my hand. It's got some different fingers going on, we discussed. Yep. Um, you could also provide cut out shapes for the flowers and cut out stems, or they can rip them themselves. And then on our tray, we always have the, the supplies we need, such as scissors and Glue sticks. So it doesn't have to be in a fancy or in a fancy compartmentalized tray. It can be in individual baskets. Montessori also believed that movement was essential to children's learning, that they have to move in order to coordinate themselves. So the first work that they ever do is 
uh, coordination of the body in practical life. And so that extends over all of our materials. The careful counting of beads and math is built up and scaffolded from that careful scrubbing that they did and the careful detail to carrying things. So building up all of those muscles so that later on, when we're doing things that are more academic, that really do require precision, and not that carrying water doesn't, but where if you're not being careful in counting, you miss a numeral, it's built on these things. So um, let's go ahead and discuss a little bit about Pablo Picasso. Cute. Pablo Picasso grew up in Spain, where he was born on October 25th, 1881, which we know somebody born October 25th. Ursa. Baby Ursa. She's sleeping right now. Not Ursa, the person who was here. No, no, Ursa was like baby Ursa, yeah. His father was a painter and an art teacher. Pablo had little interest in school, but was an extremely talented artist and did not want to paint as others had. He wanted to create something new, so he was an innovator. And we're, we always do our Artist of the Month study just to give us the flavor of the type of art and the style of art and that artist, but you are welcome to create however you want. There have been some interesting creations in our Artists of the Month, haven't there? Yeah, so it doesn't have to look like what we do today. He went through several periods. The first period was his blue period from 1901 to 1904. And Pablo experienced the loss of a close friend named Carlos and he became very sad. Can you imagine how you would feel if your close friend passed away? Yeah. yeah. It'd be sad inside. Yeah. And if you drew things, what do you think? Would they be happy things or sad things? Nope, they would just be blue. Just blue, she said. And so that's what, what Pablo did in Paris. He began for the next four years just painting mainly in blues. It was very somber. Somber is another word that means sad. After that, though, in 1904, became his rose period. Eventually, Pablo got over his depression. And what do you think got him over his depression? A love. A love, yes, the rose period, like a Valentine's Day, roses and reds. He began to use warmer colors in his paintings, including pinks, oranges, and beiges and reds. Art historians called this time in his life the rose period. After that, in 1907 to 1921, became cubism. He became uh, an experimenter in the style of cubism, where subjects are analyzed and broken up into different sections. So when we have our constructive triangles, and we take those triangles and we put them together to make a new shape, and then we break them apart, that's kind of what he did, right? He took people's faces or situations and broke them apart, and then looked at them from different perspectives and smooshed them back together. So Izzy's nose, back here. Izzy's eyeballs, maybe over here. We don't know. We my should try eyeballs that on there. Oh, my eyeballs up there. We should try that later, huh? Your Just glasses. My glasses um, over here. The glasses right here. Under my arm, yes, because my armpit needs to see. <laughs> um, Picasso began in 1912 to combine cubism and collage, and collage is what we're going to be doing today. <clears throat> Excuse me. He would apply materials such as colored paper, newspapers, and wallpaper to his paintings to give them added dimension. And dimension is uh, something that has to do with size. So when we talk about the pink tower, it changes in three dimensions all the way around. And the red rods change in one dimension, length. And the brown stair changes in two dimensions, thickness. Right? After this came the neoclassical style. Neo mean new, classical meaning old. Um, and so the classical styles of uh, paintings long, long ago, which were more realistic looking. And then in 1924, he became interested in the Surrealist movement. You like that movement? I don't even know what that movement is. <laughs> like Salvador Dali, and the persistence of time with the melted clocks all over the place. Do you like that one? And like scissors have eyes and they're walking around. No. Well, yeah. Surrealist paintings weren't supposed to make any sense. And some people called this time his monster period. You can do some monster paintings later. He is considered one of the most prolific uh, modern artists. Scissors with eyes with little bangs. <laughs> the little bangs. And he produced did. over 1,800 paintings and 1,200 sculptures. And today we're going to be working on a re representation of this, which is Mon aux Fleurs. And that is a Romance language French, Mon meaning hands, aux Fleurs, with flowers. We like in Spanish, we be Manos con Flores, right? So the words sound very similar. And this was done in 1958. So when he was moving past that surrealism, too? that's his blue period. So it went from that to that? For the, yeah, so for three years. That was it. long. Yeah, no, definitely. He was he was sad for a long time. How, how sad would you be for a long time? Something happened to a friend of yours, I think you'd be sad for a while, wouldn't you? We've, 
We have a little story um, about Picasso that we'd like to share. We'll go over some highlights just so you can see some more of his work. Because unfortunately, since we are yeah, I see that. Since we're so far away from each other right now, you can't see our three-part cards. They're kind of tiny, right? Yeah. Pablo Picasso was one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. He was born in Malaga, Spain in 1881 and died in France in 1973. He stayed in Europe. Right. And Europe is what color? I never even saw Red. that picture. You didn't? Picasso, so if you look at one of our maps in the classroom, Europe is our red continent. Picasso's father was an art teacher at a local school, and he encouraged his son to paint and draw. And this says, I think we have a great artist on our hands. I think we have a great mess on our hands. What can I see? Pretty sexist since the mom has to do the cleaning, but back in the day, <clears throat> the dad could do the cleaning too, right? Or Picasso could clean his own things. See what he's eating? I'm that paint? No, it's his food. Picasso's painting style changed over the period of his life more than any other great artist. He always was trying new and different things. The painting above was done when he was only 15 years old. So four years older than your brother. Like what? Erwin, yeah. So in four years, Erwin could do this painting. Alec. No, five years younger, or four years younger than Alex. Definitely, he could do that one. This painting was done when Picasso was 57. There's quite a difference between them, right? So this is when he was 15, and this is when he was 57. They both have five in them. They do both have five in them, don't they? Which do you like better? That one. You like this one better. Which one do you like better, friends? Do you like the altar boy, or do you like the boy in the sailor suit? Do you like the more realistic one, or the one that's more like cubism, surrealism? Or the one that looks like a cartoon. Yeah. You like the cartoon character? It looked like a cartoon character. Sometimes Picasso would paint things that looked very flat, and sometimes he would paint things that looked very round. When Picasso was 19, he left Spain and went to Paris. Some of the first paintings he did there looked a lot like the works of other famous French artists. This painting reminds many people of the work done by Toulouse the Track. Some of Picasso's other early paintings remind people of Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Monet. <clears throat> and we'll be studying Van Gogh later. Vincent Van Gogh. Yep, Vincent Van Gogh. And this is uh, something happened. We talked about this. Pablo had his best friend die, and he was sad. Wait, none you know, of his I'm yeah, the, none of his paintings were selling. He was almost starving. And blue can be a very sad color. So almost all of the people in his paintings during this time are blue and look very sad. What do you think this person playing the guitar is thinking about? How do you think they're feeling? What do you think? Uh, think he's comfortable? No. Some people thought Picasso's blue paintings were great. Others, including his father, thought they were too strange. So his paintings are controversial, which means people have a lot of opinions about them and they differ. Then came his rose period. He fell in love with a girl named Ferdinand. And soon a happier color started appearing. I don't get it. Once he came in and bought my blue paint, now he's buying all my pink paint. <laughs> That's supposed to be Picasso. Wait, do you read these? Why is it blue? People aren't blue. It's great. Look at the expression. Why is everything blue? That's when they didn't like his blue period. Some of them did. Not only were Picasso's colors happier during the Rose period, but he started painting happier things. He painted a lot of circus people. He often painted them with their animals. Wait, I don't see the animals at all. Well, not in this one. This is just one. He did 1,800 paintings. We can't find them all. That looks like he's bowing. He's like, actual service. Actual service. The Rose period didn't last very long, though. Picasso found a new way to paint that was exciting and different. Let's learn about it. It is... Cubism. And look at this painting. Can you see the picture of the man's face? Can you see a the cat, cat? The bottle. A bottle. A glass. Can you find anything else? Okay, I like dress. It looks like the man has been broken up into little cubes, and that's where cubism gets its name. There's from. the cat. There's the man's face. It looks like a lion's face. It looks like a lion's face. Let's show it to our friends too so they can see. Anything else you can find? Uh, I found the glass. You found the glass. Cool. I also found it's like a hide and seek. I found the glass right here. Yeah. And the bottle right there. It's a hide and seek, huh? And there's more things in the bottle. It is. 
Cubism is one of the most important periods in the history of modern art. Paintings are supposed to look wonderfully real like me. Stop, you're breaking me up. For hundreds of years, <laughs> art is a joke. For hundreds of years, artists tried very hard to paint things so they would look real. Then Picasso came and along and started to paint people and things that didn't look the way they were supposed to. Picasso was always shocking people when he started painting people with eyes and noses in the wrong places. Well, even some of his friends thought he had gone too far. Where does Picasso get these ridiculous ideas? Shh, here he comes with his new girlfriend. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Picasso kept working that? with cubism and it changed over the years. It became more colorful and flatter and it became easier to see what he was painting. In the three musicians, you can see three musicians and tell what instruments they are playing. So, the three musicians. I can't tell what the third guy's playing. You can't tell what the third guy's playing? I can't tell what he's playing. You can't tell what they're he's playing, playing, huh? He's, he's, what, what? I don't know. That's interesting, though. Wait, who has the guitar? I think this one has the guitar right here in that person because that's their hand and it has the little um, orange and yellow triangles. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Then where is he at? This one has, I don't know what that is, musical notes of some sort. I think he's a band leader to one, two, and one, two, three. Just, uh, Picasso visited Rome, a city filled with statues and monuments, and when he returned, he did a series of paintings where people looked like they had been chiseled from stone. In 1937, something happened that made Picasso paint his most powerful and serious painting. During a civil war that was going on in Spain, a small town was destroyed by bombs. Thousands of innocent people were killed or injured. Picasso became very angry and used everything he knew to make a painting that would show the world how foolish war was. He named the painting after the town that was destroyed. So it's a type what of town was art this? activism. What town was this? Bernica. Picasso used darker colors, cubism, and lots of expression to get his angry feelings across. He also used size. This painting is huge. It's 12 feet high and 25 feet wide. So if you put two teacher Chris's... Two teacher Chris's stacked on top. That's how big it is. Well, that, actually, teacher Chris would be taller twice. Teacher Chris is 6 feet 6 inches tall, so that would be a 13 foot high painting. That's 12. So we just have to, to take off teacher Chris's head. Oh. <laughs> be cubist. Right? Why would you take off your Well, because it's one extra foot. Six, six and a half plus six and a half is 13. All right. Many of Picasso's paintings look funny because of the way he moves eyes, noses, and chins around. Oh my God. The amazing thing about these paintings is how much they look like the real person. Look at the painting of Picasso's best friend on the opposite page. Does it look like the same person shown below? So mm -hmm. there's the painting and there's the friend. And would you, how would you what paint? What did he say? You got, it says, I'd hate to see how I would have come out if I weren't his best friend. So if you painted Alana, would you make her look good? Yes. Yes. I'd make her look colorful. Colorful. The thing that made Picasso such a great artist was his originality. He had the imagination to try new and different things through his entire life. Yeah, that was a little horrific, kind of. That looks scary. That's scary, doesn't it? Picasso lived to be 92 years old. He was a great painter, but he was great at other things too. He made sculptures, prints, drawings, beautifully colored dishes and bowls, and he even made costumes and scenery for plays. He made costumes. He was an all around artist. It's a lot of fun to see real Picasso paintings. You'll be surprised at how big some of them that are. That was a very short book. Look for his paintings in your art museum. And there are some museums here that, where his things are, in Barcelona, in New York, at the Art Institute in Chicago, at Washington, D.C., Madrid, and Paris. And actually, the ones in Chicago, the town you were born in, in Naperville, has a Picasso in the park. It's red. It's very abstract. Wait, in New York? No, in Naperville. In That's New York, Picasso. they have them? They have them at the museum. I don't know that they have a Picasso. Did you go there to the museum when you were in New York? Yeah. Uh, well, no, I grew up in New Jersey, so I went to the museum all the time in New York. Wow. I know, right? Um, and there's a big sculpture in Chicago too. This one right here is in Daly Square in Chicago. Do you remember that at all? Probably not. You were two when we moved. But the one in Naperville is like this, but it's red and there's no face. You, well, you can't really see the face if there is nope, one. There. Let's turn this around because this is what we're doing now. What are we doing? <clears throat> the Man of Fleurs. The Man of Fleurs. Man of Fleurs. So, we're, supposed to so we're going to, we have art underlays ready. Yes. And you'll need a pencil if you're going to be tracing. And, and your hand. 
and uh, some hands already cut out, or you can trace them on your own if you'd like. And would you like to trace one more hand? You can do any color hand you want. Here, give me the green piece of paper. I'll trace a hand real quickly and show our friends. You can put your hand in any position you want. So let's try this. My hand's gonna be like this. And there is something very unique about Pablo Picasso's Monoflores, and it has something to do with the hands. So if you want, don't look up what the unique thing is. Look at the picture and see if you can figure out what makes those hands unique. Look at this. This is what I'm about her hands. Yeah. You're gonna be, doing. You're gonna be trying to catch its flowers. Yeah. It's a so it's a bouquet of flowers. He did a peace bouquet and some other um, works too at this he, time. It was he, similar. The hand actually dropped, accidentally dropped the flowers. So the hand's trying to get them. You could, probably could get some ribbon too. What do you think? Ribbon to tie around the flowers that you made? All right, there we go. So you want a little bit of your wrist or four how, how is this gonna work? <laughs> well, well, okay, so that's a good question. Here's a glue stick for you. And, it's not really and a glue stick for me. May I have another small tiny wee? Would you like another hand? I'll take these two. You're gonna take two? How many hands do you want? Two, to hold the, no. So, well, you already have a hand over there. I'll take one hand. Wait, one hand, all right, I'll take this hand. All right, so you wanna bend it at the knuckles like this. at the knuckles, like so. I did it. <laughs> I bend it however you want, so if you want the hand to show, whatever you're gonna do, like that. Is this right? However you want it to be. There's no right I or wrong. I need it so that I can, that I can, that I can hold it. Or you can bend it there at the knuckles, like that. Will you help me? No, figure out what you wanna do. You can figure I'm it trying out. to make it look like it's actually hard. Well, so, so first we're gonna do this. We're gonna figure out where we want the hands to go. Yeah. Like that. Let's see. Hmm. And then you're going to glue part of the hands down. So where you bent, we'll put some glue on there. How do I do this for my hand? Ah, like this. Think. There. That way when we glue it this way, the flowers will be in there. And you can look at the picture. I don't See? know what I'm doing. You keep one open like this. Is it right? <laughs> it looks like a cardboard. How do you want it to look? There's no right or wrong. I don't know. You don't know. Well, if this one's going to go over here and it's going to go that way, like that, is that how it's going to go? I just want flower to be in it. Yeah, so let's glue it down. Here. Like this. You blew right here where you bent. I don't want this anymore. Oh, you just want one hand? Yeah. Right, so like that. Because that hand looks beautiful. And then you're going to turn it that oh, way. Oh, God. Is it good? When you're ready to put the flowers in. So let's get our flowers. Okay, are you doing... Why is uh, it like this? Because we're going to put the flowers and then glue it all the way down. So we have some stems. But we don't need them. But we don't have the flowers. Or we can use the torn paper technique, which is really good for building up hand-eye coordination and fine motor skills. So ripping actually takes a lot of practice to rip in a straight line or to rip something the way you want it to be ripped. Um, so oh don't my. discredit the use of just hands. Or you can cut. Do you want to cut? All right. I'm making, so we're going to tuck our stems in, figure out how we want them to go. I'm making three flowers. That's all I'm making. Just three flowers. Okay. Yep. How many flowers do you make? I think I'll do two. You can tuck them inside there like that. Okay. So once you have them tucked the way you want, the stems, go ahead and put some more glue on your hand and we'll glue it in place. Okay. So it's a layering technique of layering our collage. Nope, this does not look good. I like that one. Mm -hmm. That way. Oh, no. Now I'm going to use whatever I can do to make sure. My stem went out. <laughs> I don't even know how to do this. Yeah, well, you'll figure it out. Don't worry. There's no right or wrong. No, there isn't. It's all just fun. Oh, uh, where do I put this? Okay. Here. All right, and then the last thing you want to glue probably is the stems down. And I mean, you don't have to glue all the way down to the paper. There can be some movement. Flowers move, don't they? So maybe you want a little bit of movement. Where do I put this? <laughs> put what? This giant paint blob. Giant. Well, go ahead and put your stems in and then fold it over. So put your stems in. 
Oh god. Stem down, you gotta stem down. Stem down, stem down. Alright. Line your stems up wherever you want them to be, and then we're gonna fold that over and it'll keep the stems in place. Is that how you want them to go? Up that line? You want them to hang down off the paper? Yes. I like that. Those are very long stems. I'm gonna do like that. And now go ahead and put a little bit of glue on your forearm for it right here. Got it. There you go. And then do you want to glue the thumb in place or keep it lift? Oh, there was a thumb in place. All right, so, so just put a little glue on the thumb. Now I'm gonna glue this finger. Are you? Okay, if you want to, you don't have to. You can leave it up so there's a little bit of movement. Oh, I like that, yeah. I like how you, you did that. There. Is it working? Yeah. I think this is good glue, I just bought it. All right, let's look like, yeah. up and show everyone our hands so far. So I'm using two hands. Isabel is using one hand. And you can see there's movement in the hands. That's why we kind of wanted to cut off the fingers. Um, now I wanted it to go like this, so it's like, ta -da, ta -da, for you, flowers. All right, now we have to actually make the flowers. So you can do, again, cut paper ones. or <laughs> torn paper. Do you want to tear some paper or use cut? That's too big. <laughs> well, is it too big, though? I mean, that's it's the question. Look how big it is. So look at this picture. You have big ones and small ones. Okay. Whatever you want. There's no such thing. There's no right or wrong. Wait, do I put it on top or on the top? Where do you want to put it? So I'm just going to tear okay, off. Okay, this looks like pumpkin. And hopefully your zinnias are starting to grow at home. They are. Yeah, ours are, for sure. All right, I only have two stems, so. I only have three stems. You only have three. That looks like a weird flower. Well. Like cubism and surrealism are weird, aren't they? And if you want, you can add some leaves. I hope if you're if you've watched the video and now you're following along at home, that you're getting yours just the way you want it as well. <laughs> Look at my hair's looking kind of crazy too. I love it. It's a lot of fun. This looks like a purple flower now. Does it? Yeah. Ta-da! Mine kind of looks like, I don't know, like a um, ladybug exploded <laughs> on top of mine. Are you ready to reveal to everyone what ours looks like? Nope. No, not yet. Still working? Look at this, Ma. Oh, hold on, I'm going to add a, a leaf. A little leaf. Why am I making a leaf? Why not? I'm making two leaves. Because I only have um, two stems, so I'm giving it a leaf. You can do whatever you I'm want. I'm giving mine one leaf each. One leaf each. Okay, well, I'll start to tidy up our work. I don't know what I'm singing. That's okay. Are you ready for the big reveal? No, I'm still doing my leaves. Still doing your leaves? Okay. And then I'll add a couple more petals on because my flower's looking a little flower anemic. That's why you don't do the ripping. What? That's why you don't do rip. Why not? I like the rip paper. It was fun. Look I at this. I like ripping paper. Look at my face. Ripping paper can be very therapeutic. It gets to rip things up. We yes. don't always get to rip things in life, do we? My got, my flowers are exploding. Let's just say that. I got okay. glue on my hand. So don't judge my flowers. They're exploding everywhere. I'm not judging your flowers. Right. Right. They look like they came out of a dump. They look lovely. <laughs> look at the leaf. They're very round. Ready? Ta-da. Ta-da. Let's see yours. Hold yours up. Nailed it. Nailed it. So that is our Picasso study. And we invite you to Come do plant. a monoflor study or pick another one of Picasso's works that you'd like to study. Perhaps you'd like to cut out some different shapes and see if you can make faces out of them. You want to try that? No. Should we do that next maybe? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You want to say goodbye to everyone? Goodbye. Goodbye. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye. And if you like, on Wednesday, bring your Picassos to our Zoom meeting and share them.